Now, let's talk about dream analysis. Uh, how many of you, first of all, remember their dreams? Raise your hand if you remember your dreams often. Okay. How many of you have remembered a dream at least, one, one dream at least in the last year? Okay. Uh, how many of you never remember their dreams? Anybody never? Okay. A few. Uh, by the way, like, uh, when I started my psychoanalysis, I did not used to remember my dreams. I, was, I would usually not remember my dreams. And so my analyst was like, well, you know, we're going to work with dreams. And I was like, that's going to be interesting because <laughs> I don't remember my dreams. And that very night after the first session that I started, I had a nightmare that woke me up in the middle of the night with, that I remembered with absolute clarity and that was very, very interestingly related to everything I had talked about in my first session. And that really got my attention, let me tell you. Because I was open to the idea, but a little skeptical. I was like, okay, you know, most likely we have an unconscious. It's, I, I'm willing to believe that dreams are a doorway to the unconscious. But when I had such a clear manifestation of like, here you go, here's a dream, very clear, very fairly easy to interpret, fairly interesting. I was like, wow. Uh, and then from that moment on, I started remembering my dreams. When I talk about this in class, every once in a while, people, some people who don't remember their dreams remem start remembering them. So, uh, dreams, you know, dreams are like um, you, you're, uh, the muscles you're not aware of in yoga. We always dream. If you don't remember your dreams, it's not that you're not dreaming. You are dreaming, you just don't remember your dreams. So we all have dreams, uh, but uh, we have to first remember them in order to work with them. So uh, being in a situation where you're thinking that it might be worthwhile to remember your dreams, like a psychoanalysis, can be enough nudging to, for you to remember them. Uh, I would say the unconscious is like, I like to think of it as a scaredy cat. You know, it's like uh, you, you can't just go boom, you know, grab it. You can't grab your unconscious and force it out. You know? It's like, they say, well, another metaphor would be falling in love. You can't force somebody to fall in love with you. Uh, you can't force your unconscious to manifest. You have to uh, be open to it, be patient, and you know, have a sort of like a free-flowing relationship with your unconscious, a playful, open-minded, accepting, non-judgmental relationship with your unconscious way to manifest. So if you are very uptight in your ideas, if you're very judgmental of yourself, uh, if you're very uh, uncomfortable with the idea of discovering stuff about yourself that doesn't fit your self-concept, uh, it's going to be hard for you to explore your unconscious. So if you're like game for like, okay, whatever manifests, uh, and realize that maybe not all of it is scary or weird. That maybe what you think is weird is not weird at all, but in fact is interesting. So, so it takes, you know, that kind of like, uh, that kind of playfulness, plasticity, to explore your unconscious and, and your dreams. So dreams have a quality that is, that is uncontestable. That's why, you know, Freud loved them. If we remember dreams, uh, I, I would say like, I would let, let me take a bet. All of you who remember your dreams, I am sure you have had sexual dreams. I'm sure of that. <laughs> I can, uh, you know, assert it. And you know, we're like, oh, you know, how do you know? That's weird to talk about sexual. I'm not going to ask you to talk about your sexual dreams. <laughs> but I, you know, I know we have them. We have them. Right? They, they have an uncontestable quality. And sometimes they, you know, they're kind of embarrassing. We remember them. Like, with, first of all, it might be embarrassing to think about sex, it might be embarrassing to see, you know, to realize what is the nature of those sexual dreams, right? What are some of, but there might be other forms of embarrassing dreams. There might be dreams where you have, where you're violent, where you're hitting somebody or, or you know, doing violence to somebody. You might be like embarrassed by that too. You might be like, whoa, you know, I'm not, I don't think of myself as violent. I was, I didn't like that dream, you know? Or you might have, you know, scary dreams. You know, they, they, might, they might be uncomfortable in the kind of fears that manifest. Or, you know, there might be all other kind of ways in which we judge our dreams. We might think of them as silly, as, uh, you know, we might think of them as weird. Uh, so, 
but the thing is that they are a, produ a product of our unconscious. Now, the, you know, uh, Freud wrote a, a heavy volume in the, in the interpretation of dreams. Where, and he was a medical doctor, right? At the time, all of those were medical doctors. He had a pretty good series of uh, scientific approach to trying to rule out factors that influence a dream. So, for example, you know, the physical condition of the room you sleep in influences what you dream, you know? So if you're too hot, you know, you're more likely to have a dream where you're in a desert or you know, in a hot tub. Uh, if you're too cold, you might have a dream where you're in the snow. You know? Or if you have a cover over your, your nose and mouth, you might have a dream where you're drowning. Right? So there, there's kind of physical, you know, there's, there's dreams that have been said where somebody, well, a patient of Freud had a, a, um, a picture that was framed over his bed full over him on his head and they had a whole dream where he was being executed with guillotine, right? Uh, and uh, at the moment where the thing was touching his neck and had a whole dream of a whole life of being a, a, a um, criminal uh, up to the point where he was executed, right? <laughs> so, you know, the, you know, the uh, dreams can be really, so those, those external factors have an influence in your dream. What happened the day before or the week before, what's happening in your life has an influence in your dream. Quite often you dream about stuff that's related to what happened yesterday or that week, right? That said, dreams will never be exactly a reproduction of your day. There will always be something different. There will always be characters that are a little bit different. Usually you will filter on feelings maybe more uh, strongly than you feel. You know? Maybe if you're repressing certain emotions, you might feel like really sad about something but you're not allowing yourself to feel that. And maybe you have a dream where you're crying, right? Maybe you haven't cried in a long time in your real life. But in your, in your dream, you feel such great sadness that you're crying, right? Uh, so, it's, you know, your unconscious is expressing stuff in, through dreams that you don't allow yourself to experience in your daily life, that you cannot be fully aware of. That's where it's useful. So how do you interpret dreams? That's, that's where the uh, art of psychoanalysis becomes useful, and there's different methods, but I'm proposing one that's kind of the Jungian approach, which is the one I know more. There's, there's small variation. Now, dream analysis is a complex matter. But I'll say this. There's a lot of different beliefs about dreams. Some people believe that dreams are a portal to another dimension, that you can see the future through dreams, and Jung kind of believed that that you can see maybe the past or, you know, that you can sense what's happening away from this present moment. I don't know about all that. Uh, maybe. I'm open to it. But, uh, but for sure, to me, dreams are, I tend to think of them not as an answer to a question, but a question. So the dream is a question that your unconscious poses to you to sort of nudge you to see things a little differently than you see them. So again, I go through my life with my waking consciousness, making decisions, pursuing in a particular direction. And I have a dream that tells me, huh, have you thought about that? Have you considered that factor? Uh, are you correct about seeing things this way? Is your filter uptight here? Have you forgotten about this side of the situation? So they kind of like, we perceive things unconsciously, broad, more broadly than our, the screen of our awareness allows us to do. And at night, our dreams bring back some of that stuff that we filtered out. And uh, if we consider it, we might see things more broadly. We might change our perspective. We might, uh, and usually for me, what I have found is dreams make me grow in a way that makes me feel freer, that make, makes me make better decisions for myself that makes me be a better person, I think, a happier, freer, uh, more competent person, more aware person. So how do you do things? First, you have to remember the dream. So making a commitment to remember your dreams, caring about your dreams is the first step. If you think dreams are not useful, if you don't have any reason to remember your dreams, you probably will not remember them. So that's why when I started a psychoanalysis, where a big aspect of it was to analyze dreams, and I was game for it. I started remembering my dreams. Uh, then the other thing that you can do is writing them down. So you have a, a discipline of when you wake up in the morning, 
If you remember even a fragment of a dream, try to make the effort to recall what it was and write it down. So it's a discipline. You can type it down. Some people like to talk them out, you know, like if you have a recorder on your phone or something. Uh, I prefer to write. Write them in as many details as you can. If you don't remember the full details of a dream, it doesn't matter. But when you start writing it down, you tend to remember more details. Dreams have a logic that is not logical. So temporality might be suspended. You might be, you know, in this classroom one second and the other moment you're, you know, in your parents' garden and, you know, you know a different age. So, you know, you might have incomplete interaction that transform into something else. So, uh, it doesn't matter too much the temporality of things. It doesn't matter too much. Sometimes you have characters that appear in your dream and you don't know exactly who they are. Like there was this guy in my dream that I don't know who he was, but then you try to, you, one way to help, you know, to explore that is to see what does that person remind me of? Now that person kind of looked like my uncle and remind me, you know, of a mix of my uncle and, uh, you know, my, my teacher, you know, I don't know, something like that. And that, that gives you clues already, so try to do that. Uh, once you've written down the dream, usually in the psychoanalytical uh, realm, you tell it to the analyst, the psychoanalyst. Now, writing down is one way to make the dream more real. When you verbalize it, it makes it even more real. So it brings the content of the dream more to your consciousness. When you analyze it and discuss it, you're even more conscious of it. So it's a process of really taking things that are in the unconscious and bringing them into consciousness. That's, that's what we're doing here, right? Uh, why does verbalizing make things more conscious? How many of you remember when you were a kid at school or at home and something uh, bad happened to you, like you fell on the ground and you hurt yourself, right? Or some kid like, you know, you know bumped you and you go to the teacher, you go to your mom and you start telling, hey, you know, this is what happened. And as you're telling, what happened, you start crying, right? How many of you remember having that happen, right? So that is, like, that is like the power of verbalizing your emotions. If you don't express them, they don't have as much reality. So when you verbalize a dream to another person, could be a psychoanalyst, could be a confidant, it becomes more real. The emotions that are present in the dream become more real. You feel them more, so that's why it's important. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the other step is to make associations. Uh, so you take different elements of the dream, key elements of the dream, and you make free associations. So let me give you an example. Let's say I dreamed that uh, I was uh, riding a white horse to Cal Poly, and uh, I was cut off by a red Ferrari and fell off my horse and you know, was really upset that, that you know, asshole driver. That's the dream, right? Uh, so what would be the key elements of the dream? Would be a white horse, uh, going to Cal Poly, being cut off, uh, red Ferrari, right? And, feel, and anger, right? Well, well, anger, you would analyze that, right? So you would make free association with all of this. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about horses? First thing that comes to mind, right? A series of things. You're not trying to make sense of it consciously, rationally to justify it. Association is like first thing that comes to mind. You might think horses, like cowboys, you know, civil war, I don't know what comes to you. What, it might make no sense. You might say horses, you know, uh, you might think uh, Titanic, I don't know. Uh, and that doesn't make any sense, like what, Titanic, horses? You don't judge yourself, you just let the associations come. Now, very important, if you have embarrassing associations, like sexual associations or uh, you know, other kind of embarrassing association, you don't want to censor yourself. You will let any kind of association come to your mind. That's again the process of really trusting, you know, the, the psychoanalyst, trusting yourself. Once you've made a list of associations, you um, think about what's going on in my life right now what are some life issues that I'm, uh, I'm experiencing? And how, does, how do those associations and this, the, this dream 
what kind of question does it pose? What kind of, what kind of things did it reveal about what's going on in my life? So, you know, you might be thinking, uh, I'm stressed right now, like, I'm taking too many classes, uh, I, um, you know, like, I, uh, I feel uh, that, um, I feel upset about rich people uh, being, like, uh, richer, and uh, the economic system we live in, and that's symbolized by the red Ferrari, I mean, I, I don't know what, you know, I'm just making up something. But you might realize, ah, you know, like I'm like, uh, right now, I didn't realize how angry I was and how upset I was about what's happening in the economy and, and the stress that I'm feeling in my life. Right? That might be something that could come out of analyzing a dream like that. And then you might think about, okay, what should I do about that? What changes can I take in my life to address that? Um, there is a YouTube video that gives you an example of a dream analysis that was made by some students uh, of mine in the past. I invite you outside of class to look at this as an example of how you analyze a dream. Um, if you, if you want to try to analyze a dream that you remember, uh, I would suggest uh, you give it a try. Y you can really, really have uh, great insights into your filters and your life. Uh, and if you want to, you know, if you have a dream that you want to analyze and you don't know how to and you want to, you know, you want to ask me to help you, I'm happy to do that. Uh, let's, let's stop here. So thank